Good evening and welcome to On the Record, a debate-style television talk show where Bahamians will find the balanced, true, and open debate they've been looking for. July 6, news broke that Moody's credit rating agency was once again placing the Bahamas' credit rating on review for a downgrade. It's left some in a virtual panic. The opposition and current administration are, of course, in the proverbial blame game, not to speak of the many financial experts and voices coming out of the woodwork with I told you so's and advice of every nature. But the question is, what is really going to happen to our economy should this downgrading continue? Can we survive another downgrade? Is this new administration capable of digging us out of the hole we're in? What really attracted Moody's attention to threaten us with a downgrade? We will discuss all of this tonight and find some answers. Our topic tonight is the effects of a potential further downgrade on our economy. And the expert is here to discuss it with us. Our guest tonight is none other than Gowan Bo, chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. It's all on the record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. Our discussion begins on the other side of this break. On the Record is brought to you by Alive, the nation's newest and best LTE network. Good to be alive. This is us. We all live here. And while we don't think of ourselves as numbers, in the grand scheme of things, numbers are part of who we are. Like your phone number, for instance. That's why at Alive, we believe you should keep your number when you switch. Go in store today and ask an Alive Switch Angel. They'll make it real simple for you. We are Alive. Wait, I telling you that's form, but you ain't know the time, eh? That come from Bahamas form products. They stuff look like real column and molding, but you pay much less. People has used this form for everything from decorating the house and classroom to building junk in the costume and putting up sign. This form so versatile, it's versatile. Bahamas form products carrying on bad pay. Concrete grieving cause form taking over. If you is bill, if you warm bill, if you ain't no how to bill, just check out Bahamas form right down Soldier Road Industrial Park. I used to wait for them, you see? But stick to the form. Don't mention my name in your call. We are geared up to discuss the effects of a potential further downgrade on our economy. My guest in studio tonight is Gawain Bo. He's the immediate past president of the Bahamas Chamber of Commerce. Also, he is the president of the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants, also known as BICA, as well as a well-known uh, uh, expert um, in, in, in many fields. Gawain, first of all, thank you for coming on the show again. This certainly is not your uh, first time here. but. Certainly, um, we wanted to talk about uh, this potential downgrading, and I think uh, for, for those of us not intimately involved, it really came as a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that I think that you talked about the last time you were here, the mm -hmm. fact that the government needed to keep a, a close eye on the situation. But first of all, let's establish up front um, Moody's Credit Rating Agency. It's warned that uh, it might be a downgrade to the Bahamas' credit rating to junk status. Minister of Finance, um, the Honorable Peter Turncrest, has blamed the PLP for the position okay. um, that the country now finds itself in. I want to talk, first of all, about how and why Moody would have gotten to this point where we're looking at a review 
of, of, of the situation again? Well, I think that we, we have to start from very basics. And I think for the average person on the street, all they hear is this rating agency and downgrade, downgrade immediately is goes the thing to that doom and gloom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we put it into the context of your household or your individual uh, perspective, Think about the country as your own fiscal affairs or your own financial affairs. Mm -hmm. um, when you go to a bank to borrow, you know, the bank puts a rating on you. And we've heard the term prime, subprime as it relates to borrowers. But they look at the fundamentals when you go into a bank. So what's your salary? For the government, that's their revenue. What's your committed expenditure? Um, for the government, that's their expenses. Uh, what assets do you have in terms of a house, a car, what you have to pledge? The government has assets, but we'll come back to that because that's the weakest link we have right now in terms of our financial information. Then they look at your existing debt. For the government, that's its debt. And overall, the, a bank will look at you and say, well, how strong are you and how able are you to pay back your money? So from Moody's perspective, Moody's is, if you will, the person that the bank has turned to to say, well, give me an understanding of the country. So they're looking at our fiscal matters in terms of saying, well, how, how are these guys doing? So how much do they owe the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. So Bahamians as well as international bondholders, et cetera. They are then looking and saying, well, what is it that they're doing every year in terms of revenue and expenditure? Now, a frightening statistic, I think, when we were last year, since independence, we have not had one year with a fiscal surplus. So what do I mean in layman's terms? So put that into your household context. We've not had one year where your salary has been sufficient to cover your expenditure as it relates to your utilities, uh, buying food, putting gas in your car. Not one single year. In 44 years. In 44 years. Wow. So I think when we stop and say, well, who is to blame? That ship has sailed. <laughs> um, in reality, everyone is to blame. Mm -hmm. And we have to look at it as a country to say, well, when you go to the bank to borrow money, do you go in with the negative perspective or the positive perspective? Because really, you would say to the bank, if I didn't need the money, I wouldn't be here. Right. So if I need the money, how do I demonstrate that I have a capacity to repay? Mm -hmm. And that's where if you will, the rubber hits the road where we talk about the Bahamas. We have to be able to demonstrate a credible plan, regardless of administration. From an outsider's perspective, government is continuous. The Bahamas is the one that has 71, 72 percent debt to GDP. Now put that into, again, your household. That means that our borrowings are effectively over 70 percent of the country's income. So not your own income. If you think that you work for a large organization, we as an individual owe more or 70 percent of what the whole company is earning. So when you put that into its perspective, my salary is only a fraction of what the company is earning and usually a small fraction of that. Mm -hmm. So when I'm saying, how am I going to pay this back, you can see why Moody's would start to be concerned when they look at saying we are going to have to borrow an additional $722 million. That's one element. But when you break it down to saying, but on your annual expenditure versus your revenue, you're projecting this year you will have spent more than 500 more than you earned, 500 million now, half a billion dollars. But in the next year, you're still projecting that you will spend 322 million more than you've earned. So when you put all of that into its context, and you think now if you were a lender or you were a person evaluating the strength of a country, would that give you cause for pause? It certainly would. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really stop and say, well, OK, those are realities. We shouldn't be hiding away from what we, where we are today. We've, we've achieved that. And I use that uh, tongue in cheek. We've gotten ourselves there. Mm -hmm. What we have to be focused on is, well, how do we demonstrate to persons we'll reverse that? How are we, what are the plans what are the milestones and what are the steps we're going to take? When we spoke about fiscal consolidation um, several years ago, when they were talking about the introduction of VAT, uh, the government of the day spoke about a three-pronged approach. It spoke about revenue reform, and, and VAT was a key plank in that whole overall reform. We also spoke about expenditure reform. The average citizen will look and say, well, I don't see any expenditure reform. 
because I don't see any tightening of the belt. And we know in our own households, when things get rough, certain luxuries fall mm -hmm. away. Which is what you're supposed to. Which is what you yeah, expect. Supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But the third element, <clears throat> which has to get a significant amount of attention, is expanding the economy. The government collects from the economy's productivity about 22% of the overall product of the country. So we talk about GDP. Really, let's think about GDP as the income or profits of the country. All businesses, all agencies, public and private, all together, what do they produce? The government taxes its citizens and corporations, etc., roughly 22% of the country's earnings. And that's what they have to use in order to cover their operating expenses as well as their capital expenses. If I have a larger income as a country, 22% is a lot more money. Mm -hmm. If I have a contracting economy, 22% becomes a smaller number. Now, how do you factor in when you say we, government has said for 2017, um, deficit will be around 500 million? 5.5% of GDP. Yeah. How do you explain that? What does that mean for the ordinary person? When, to, to use the same analogy I have, the GDP is the country's overall income. Mm -hmm. um, in the personal context, I, I like to describe it as saying you work for a multinational, a large organization. That's the profit of that large organization. And the government's actual deficit is 5% of their actual profits. So. If we put that into the context where I said now, remember the government doesn't get the whole country's income. So if I'm only getting basically one-fifth of that, and I have a 5% deficit on this huge number, how does that then translate into the revenue that I've earned? And effectively, it means I've spent 500 million more than I've taken in. So forget the GDP number, that's a relative term. We use that. Economists may refer to it, um, ministers get up and speak to it, but if you want to say break it down, it's very simple, uh, the old adage, spending a dime while earning a nickel, that's what we've been doing. Interesting. Government is to borrow some 722 million um, to cover the deficit. That, <laughs> you know, to an ordinary person, that continues, doesn't make any sense. Well, I mean, when you count the zeros, that's the first thing that frightens you, um, to say how much it is, right? It's really brushing up on $1 billion in two years. And if we are not daunted by that, then nothing will. Whether it makes sense or not, it is, um, think about, again, your household. If you have a situation where you want to go on vacation, but you don't have any money, what do you do? Stay home. Well, that's a smart, that's a smart <laughs> answer. What does the average Bahamian do? Go to the bank. Go to the bank yeah. and borrow. Yeah. So when our income is not able to sustain our expenditure, what do we do? We borrow. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very careful that we are borrowing sensibly. A household really should be borrowing for investment in the future. If you're going to borrow money, you have a house. It, goes, it puts a roof over the head. Mm -hmm. It provides security for your family but it's an asset that will appreciate if you maintain it. And right. so when you pay back the bank for that house, at the end of the day, you have an asset to show for it. Mm -hmm. If you borrow money to buy investments, whether it be in shares of a company or invest in a partnership, et cetera, your own business, again, the intent is that the income you earn from that is far going to outweigh the cost of the borrowing, and at the end, you have an asset. Unfortunately, in the Bahamas' context, we have been borrowing for vacation. We have been borrowing for Christmas gifts, where we are leveraging our children and our grandchildren's future to cover, if you will, the fun we are having today. And that is not to say we are partying, but it is effectively saying we are spending today what our children have to pay back. And the, they're nothing to show for it at the end of the day, nothing in the assets call it. Well, that's the one I wanted to come back to okay. because well, that's I, a key element of it. Let's put a, we're gonna uh, put a pin in that right there. We are at the point of our first break in the show. So when we come back, we'll pick up that discussion sure. there. Certainly stay with us. We're at the point of our first break in the show. More on the record right after this break.
This segment is sponsored by Percy's Island Game. We're going to give you a check every week for a year. Percy's Pension Plan, Island Game. Bro, you hear about Percy's Pension Plan? Yeah, something about $1,000 a week for a year. That's Percy's Pension Plan. You could win one of five. All you got to do is put $20 on your Island Game account, and you have a chance to win up to 52 times. You know something, guys? I can need one of those Percy's Pension Plan in because with Island Game, it's surely a guarantee. Boy, I ain't got no tension, I got, I got Percy's pension. Uh, what are you doing? Calling the bank to order more checks. Go to epbahamas.com and order your checks from Executive Printers. Executive Printers. We're the authority in business and personal check printing in the Bahamas. Come in and see one of our specialists or visit us online at epbahamas.com to design and order your checks today. Shooting last night claims the life of a young woman. Providence being urged to evacuate as soon as possible. That story. Mr. Dr. Hubert Menace weighs in on those reasons. Inside the huddle, everybody, I'm Marcelo. Force officer behind bars today. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. Welcome back to On the Record. Our topic tonight, the potential effects of a further downgrade on our economy. Gawain Bo is my guest in studio tonight, president of the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants. Now, and as we went to the break, we were really talking about this issue of the debt. Yep. Um, and uh, sharing it in the sort of the, the household context and, you know, talking about, in essence, borrowing to go on vacation, if we can mm -hmm. use that uh, metaphor, so to speak. But... How is it that, that government has, has been borrowing all these years and, and the assets column continues to be so small? Yeah. Well, I would say that the, the first thing is we've not really done a true accounting of what we have. And one of the areas that BICA will be pressing with the government and is working alongside it now is the adoption of international public sector accounting standards. And what that's going to do is take this, um, what I would call, archaic style where it's on a cash basis, meaning that we only record the money we receive and the money we expend. We don't have a true record of the obligations we have incurred when we promise or we commit to do certain things. And that's why every time we've changed election, in my years of watching elections, the incoming government always says, well, the bills were left for me by the previous mm -hmm. government. It's their fault. <laughs> and <laughs> we have to get to a point where our financial records show who incurred what and when, regardless of when we pay it. Because as we know, most obligations have payment terms. So if you buy a vehicle, you may be given financing and allowed to pay it over um, you know, 10, 5 years, 3 years, 5 years. But we should be recording that obligation today. And we have a lot of that in the government where we've bought uh, defense force vessels, we've bought police cars, we've bought various other assets, but we only see the impact of that, even the Bahamas airplanes that they mentioned during the budget debate, we only see the impact of it when the expenditure or the cash outlay comes into being. So we have a difficulty in appreciating our true obligations. But going back to the asset side and why it's so small, have we really recorded all of the assets we as a country have? And I'll take, for example, some of the very basics. We see government buildings. Um, admittedly, some of them are dilapidated and, and require significant repair and maintenance. However, are those being reflected? Because those are potential revenue-generating assets. Mm -hmm. We have investments in securities. The government is a shareholder in Cable Bahamas. It's a shareholder in the holding company that has a live at this point, although that's transitory, and I want to highlight that. 
they have shares in BTC, APD in terms of the, and all of these are with a public interest element to them, and they have a value. Uh, some of them are generating dividends for the government, so there's an income to the government. But more importantly, the question is, does the government need to have these assets? Is it better for them to dispose of them and have income to help pay down the debt? Or is it better to have annual flows of income? And I'm not making a, a conclusion on, on that, side. but we need to know that these are the assets we have. I, I want to pull uh, our discussion back uh, to this potential downgrade. And there's been a lot said about how we ended up at this point. Mm -hmm. Government, um, through the minister responsible, would have said, you know, during the, the, the budget debate, the cupboards are bare. This is what we are facing as a country. Situation is worse than we would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. Um, the interim opposition leader, um, Philip Bray Davis, even the shadow uh, finance uh, minister, Chester Cooper, has come out and said, um, wrong speech, wrong time. Mm -hmm. um, and even Sir William Allen was in the, in the press this week speaking to, you know, the fact that maybe uh, the blame, there's blame on both sides. Mm -hmm. But I want to get in uh, to the discussion on really um, how much of an impact did the government's pronouncement really have on Moody's coming to review this? I think um, Sir William described it as exciting Moody's <laughs> to come <laughs> back yeah. and take another look. Well, as a rating agency, they would be annually. So mm -hmm. I think if we take the hysteria out of it, mm -hmm. Moody's, um, you would have an announcement statement around this time in any event because mm -hmm. they would be coming in. I think they are setting the stage to say that um, the information that they are gleaning from public disclosures are not positive pieces of information. And right. so therefore, that's the basis upon which they will start the discussion. I believe when you stop and you give the news of your fiscal predicament, you also need to give the other side of saying, well, how am I going to turn that? Mm -hmm. And I believe one of the commentators said that whilst you have to be very honest and transparent in where you are, you also have to give a very clear indication that you have your hands on the reins. Right. That you are now going to steer this horse and buggy in a different direction and you're going to demonstrate that there's a plan to do so. Was that, do you think, was that articulated properly in that budget debate? I believe that that's been our shortcoming for probably independence as well. That if we step back and you and I in the same generation, do you recall a national plan for the Bahamas in your lifetime? No. Nope. Okay. We have a national development plan secretariat that has been doing a tremendous amount of work. And what that has involved in it, whilst it has four pillars, it is looking at, well, what is the identity of the country? How are we going to actually leverage the assets, and I'm talking about intellectual assets, physical assets, and all of the uh, opportunities in front of us to maximize prosperity in the country? And if you have a plan, you get knocked off the plan. Not everything goes according to plan. Uh, we know that. That's true. <laughs> However, if you have a plan, you can come back to it. Mm -hmm. What we've missed as a country for many years, and like I said, going back almost from independence, certainly as I've been looking at it as a professional, a plan. Every year we get a budget statement that is pieces of paper that have line items on it. It doesn't give a clear indication of, well, what are the assumptions and estimates going into it? So what are you basing this revenue optimism on? What are you doing as it relates to expenditure? So I understand your priorities. We tend to, once a budget is allocated to a particular area, that continues into perpetuity, whether it's working or not. When we want to bring a new area, what do we do? We say we have to find more money. Well, as a government, no different than a business, you have to prioritize. Uh, if we look at a, a struggling company, a struggling company, we had many examples of this during the height of the financial crisis, the banks in the US, uh, the motor companies in the US, all of them needed bailouts. Effectively, they needed mm -hmm. um, central government borrowings to do so. But the government, before giving the money, said, well, you have to have a turnaround plan. Now, that included several things. If you have shrinking profits or difficulties in profits, you either have to figure out how you're going to grow revenues or you're going to have to cut That's expenses. Nice. Mm -hmm. And our governments have not presented a plan of saying, well, what is your priority? We speak a lot. We say we're going to grow the economy. That's a cliche now. Mm -hmm. We say we're going to curb spending. 
again, a cliche. We're going to maximize revenue collection, again, cliche. So what, what really should have been outlined in that budget? What types of things should have come forward, should have been more prominent and prevalent in that presentation um, to begin to calm some of the concerns of a Moody's and, and even the average Bahamian? Well, because like well. yourself, some of us, we'd sit and we listen and say, well, you know what's being spent. Mm -hmm. um, what you intend to spend, what you intend to borrow, but how are we going to fix this by 2020? Exactly. What I would, what I would expect to see going forward is um, the distinction between the campaign trail and reality. Well. And <laughs> this is not unique to the Bahamas, mm -hmm. meaning that everywhere you listen to campaigns, they have the most grandiose of plans. A rating agency would say, well, now you've won the government, it should simply be a presenting of that plan. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect to see from a budget? How am I going to expand the economy? I say I'm going to do so, so what am I going to do? And there were some things laid out by the government in terms of money allocated to the venture fund, um, ease of doing business that they want to pay attention to. But what are the tangible steps? So when I start thinking about the venture fund, what businesses am I really looking to promote? So Qualifies, what industry? Yeah. What what criteria? Because, you know, Bahamians, when we hear that, it's free money. I was like, we just start showing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, we need 50000 Yeah. Then we should be saying, okay, what are the tangible steps on the ease of doing business? So am I going to put my best minds in the country, regardless of partisan favor, to say, how am I going to address those factors that are hindering business expansion? And what are the things I'm going to do over six months, 12 months, two years, five years. When I look on the expenditure side, I should see priorities coming through. So if my priority is on education, I see money's being allocated to it, but I see money's being taken away from somewhere else. You mentioned, you know, moving from, from campaign rhetoric or campaign promises to reality. Mm -hmm. But if you also look at the fact that the election would have taken place in early May, you've got less than a month to prepare this mm -hmm. new budget to present to Parliament. Is that realistic enough for a, a government um, to present these kinds of um, uh, these initiatives or present these kinds of plans? Or should it have been that, you know, should we win, we're going to have this laid out to present regardless? Well, what I would say is if you truly have a plan coming in, you will be able to set it aside reality and then say, what have I adjusted in my plan because of the realities I face? So saying that I've met something I didn't expect. Um, in this day and age, if you are mature in terms of following as a strong opposition, the fiscal affairs, you should be demanding the information as it relates to revenues expenditure. These are actually a public record. I mean, it's difficult to get to it, mm -hmm. but it is information of public record. So you should really be tracking, well, where are we in our overall so country be journey? should element of surprise. Of surprise. It, yeah. it will be, because I, I think, you know, when you sit in the chair, mm -hmm. heavy is the head that wears the crown. As <laughs> soon as you true. sit down, you will be, what? But right. you should be able to say, well, this is what my plans were. You know, where I am today, this element of my plan I can't implement now. So I am going to defer that and communicate that this is what I'm planning to do and this is my deferral. And these are the areas where I'm going to put my footprint in. And I believe that the government has the flexibility of saying, I have inherited a large part of the budget. However, I am committing within three, four months, I will demonstrate to you what my budget would have looked like, and I will come back to revise what I presented. Darren, we are at the point of the halfway mark in our show tonight. We're discussing the effects of a potential further downgrade on our economy. We are going to be back right after this quick break. Stay with us.
Are you coughing, sneezing, having headaches, respiratory issues, allergies, or itchy skin? Toxic mold may be the problem. Clear Solutions Plus can help. Certified best in the Bahamas, specializing in mold removal, water damage restoration, AC duct cleaning, and more. Call Clear Solutions Plus to schedule an inspection for your home or office at 677-3138 or 427-3138. Open seven days at the Mount Royal Plaza. Clear Solutions Plus certified mold removal. Visit our website. We are your solution to indoor air pollution. Hey, beautiful. Let Amani Hair put you in the spotlight with our fabulous hair and hair care products. Longing for length? Try our wide selection of Remy and Virgin Hair. Keep it natural with hair care lines like Carol's Daughter, Ali K Naturals, As I Am, and many more. Be radiant with our wide selection of skin care products. Have questions? Connect with Amani Hair on Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Located Soldier Road and Shakur Way. Telephone 698-1155 or 422-1191. Let Amani Hair make a Barbie out of you. Get faster internet speeds for free when you get TV, internet, and phone. Ask for Trio from Rev. We are now in a new political era, a new prime minister, government, and opposition. What are the new challenges, and what role will the Bahamian people play in this new era of governance? Join me, your host, Jerome Sawyer, each week for On the Record as we examine the latest political news and views. That's On the Record, airing every Thursday at 8 p.m. on Cable Channel 212. See you then. We are back on the record. My guest tonight is Chartered Accountant Gawin Bo, who is a CFO at Fidelity Bank and immediate past president of the Chamber of Commerce, now head of BICA, the Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants. Gawin, um, we have investors out there who are watching all of this unfold. Central Bank Governor says this will not affect investments right away. Is that realistic? I mean, from a layman's perspective, I would think people will be very concerned uh, if you're looking at a country that is almost in a cycle of perpetual downgrades. Mm -hmm. I, I believe um, the governor is accurate in terms of immediate. Right. Right? Persons will not overreact. If, if you are a savvy investor, you would have been factoring in a number of things when you look at making an investment. Um, you would understand the fiscal circumstances and realities but you would also be looking at how this impacts your business. I think, however, when you have the perpetual downgrades, what happens is a lot of investment houses have criteria upon which they are even willing to invest in a country. So when you look at international pension plans or you look at international hedge funds, et cetera, venture capitalists, a lot of them will say, well, if there is a credit rating of less than Mm -hmm. I will no longer put money into the country. And that's the risk we start to run. That persons on the outside look at it in terms of saying, well, how will I get my money out? So as an investor, you have several objectives, but your principal objective is to make money and actually have that return to you. Mm -hmm. The way you look at the credit rating is saying, well, if I put money into a country and they are unable to pay their bills, do I run the risk of the government, either through taxation, appropriation or other mechanisms actually infringing upon my investment and my investment return. And that becomes a frightening prospect for an investor. You know, we have to start speaking positively about our own country. I tell persons I've lived abroad and I've never heard where I've lived anyone speak evil of their own country amongst international persons. They may chastise one another, but they don't sit and talk to an expatriate in their country negatively. My grandmother used to say, make sure you row in the house. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> when you and, get and out. keep the door closed. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what we have to be saying is, well, the Bahamas has never missed a debt payment. So we've never defaulted as a country, mm -hmm. right? We also have tremendous um, potential that we ourselves are the only ones don't see. 
international investors continue to flock to our shores, whether it is in the touristic product, whether it is in certain financial service um, sectors, whether it is in industrial sectors, etc. And we have to start saying, well, how do we become owners of our own country and destiny? That we can't rely, we hear this term foreign direct investment as always being the panacea. It is not the solution because a foreign direct investor is going to be taking his money out at I some mean, point in time. You say that's money that does not necessarily Foreign stay. investment, right. meaning a Bahamian being able to borrow foreign money to take advantage in his own country, will yes, have to pay back debt, but that money, profit, and equity in that company that he builds up over time stays here. One of the things that um, consecutive governments um, are faced with always um, promising to fix is this continued loss of revenue. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, year after year, government is not able to account for this great seepage in revenue, whether it's at the customs or um, collection of taxes, uh, but cannot seem to get a handle mm -hmm. um, on this continued loss. And I, I, I'm just wondering how much of a problem if we can discuss that, how much of a problem does that continue to be when we look at the overall economic picture? Well, it, it, it's a tremendous uh, well, Why hindrance. can't we seem to get a handle on money? It's government's money. Why can't government give an account for, for that revenue? Political will. Mm -hmm. and, and there are two sides to that. Firstly, you have to analyze, is it an efficient tax? Meaning, is it a tax easy to collect? If it's complex and cumbersome, the challenge may be that, yeah, everyone, everywhere in the world finds ways and loopholes to get around paying taxes. So if we simplify and look at all of the tax structures that we have and say, well, which ones are actually efficient and we are doing well in, in, in collecting? Which one has it been where we don't have the political will, right? So we know, although it's not a government tax, national insurance in the past had persons who deducting from their employees' wages, not remitting. That was purely political will to say, I drag them before the right. court yes. and make them pay. And depending on who you were. And the, the, yeah. the, the stripes that you had. In government, we have some scenarios where persons are evading taxes. But we have to question, well, is it the tax that is the difficulty in enforcing? When VAT was brought in, and I certainly was one of those that was championing, we need to analyze all forms of taxation. And what VAT did is by no means um, not evil. All taxes are evil when you're paying it, right? It's just a matter of the lesser of the evils. Yeah. But the compliance rate on VAT, because of the internal self-policing by says that if Jerome has a VAT TIN number and he provides a service to Gowan who has a VAT TIN number, Gowan needs his TIN number and Gowan is going to report what he spent with Jerome to deduct from his own. So if, Der if Jerome tries to avoid taxes, there's a system because so Darwin it. said he paid 10000 um, to you. You didn't report 10000 as being earned from Gowan. That system had a compliance rate of 90% and even higher, and we need to maintain that. Now, put that against the customs collections rate. And when we were doing the studies um, at the time, you know, it was less than 50%. We were finding business license in terms of compliance rates when we started talking about property taxes and all of the other taxes was less than 50 percent mm -hmm. so the question then becomes do i start to reduce the inefficient taxes and increase the efficient tax so that overall i'm still charging the same thing so if you go into the food store and you say well the item that i'm now paying um, on my bill is seven and a half percent as a actual vat but customs was 25%. If I bring customs down to zero and I put the VAT to 10, does it come to the same price? When I look at business license, um, we are the only country, well, one of the few countries that you would say tax gross revenues. So a company may be making a loss and it still has business license. Does that spur expansion and economic activity? The business owner is saying, well, I'm paying more to the, to the government mm -hmm. that I'm taking home. So. The collection and the, the woeful collection is political will, but it is also saying, is it the right tax structure for the times that we live in today? When you look at um, 
For instance, uh, a, a, a public service that is continuing to grow, when government has to borrow mm -hmm. to pay the salaries exactly. of, of public, that simply doesn't make sense. It's because we, and I've had this argument with, with several cabinet ministers on both sides of the fence, that government is not a business. I said that's the actual fallacy. Government is not a for-profit business. But even a not-for-profit organization needs to ensure that its expenses are actually matched with what mm -hmm. revenue they have coming in. And when we look at the civil service, we have to step back and say, are we getting value for money? If I am engaging persons, I need productivity that says the services that government provides, I need to ensure that these persons are giving 100% and that I minimize the bill. Because when I minimize the bill, then I'm able to give other tax concessionary type elements to companies to expand so that the people who I no longer employ can find employment in the private sector. It's not a simple answer of saying, well, we should just cut the civil service because then they just become employed, unemployed mm -hmm. in the sense that if we don't have new businesses that are able to absorb them, we have school leavers. So that's a number that is there regardless of any terminations. So if we add to that, it only shifts, if you will, the burden from the left pocket to the right pocket. So you're paying it in salaries, you would probably end up paying it in social benefits if you had a mass cut. However, you have to have a strategy and a plan that says, well, how am I going to make my civil servants accountable? How am I going to perform performance evaluation so I know that those who are underperforming, you know, the best solution is for me to figure out a way to get you out of here and find you somewhere where you would be better suited because obviously in here, you're not matching up. But it appears that those discussions are not, you know, it, We've already looked at sort of the, those pillars within the economy that, that are contributing to this problem, but it doesn't seem that there's a, a, a wide-ranging discussion, I think, which goes back to that national development plan. plan. What is the plan? And what government? I would say to you is, will you ever have that discussion in and around an election time? Because no, an incumbent government is not going to talk about cutting the civil service. Mm -hmm. And a, a challenging um, party is not going to say, the first thing I'm going to do is cut the, the size. But what it needs to do is say, well, we're not doing it arbitrarily. We're going in and we're doing it from the perspective of, what do I need in this organization in order to run efficiently? Businesses have to do it all the time. We have to make decisions around what is the appropriate headcount. It is not an it's not an easy topic because unlike large territories like the US and Europe, when you terminate a person, you may never see them again. If I terminate an individual, I can see them in the food store. I can see them at um, yeah. the carnival. I'm going to see them yeah. at Junkanoo. I'm going to run them. into them, yeah. right? And, and you know the type of stare you get. <laughs> right? That will be, you know, I won't use the term because we're on uh, TV, but you know what they're yeah. calling you, yeah. right? Yeah. And so sometimes we shy away from it. Yeah. And particularly politicians who say, well, these are my constituents. I got right? to I, How am I now going to turn around and seek to be reelected if yeah. I've done that? Yeah. Tough, but it's necessary. It is the reality of the situation. Gowan, we are at the point of our final break in the show. We have one more segment. Stay with us. We are back on the record right after this. This is us. We all live here. And while we don't think of ourselves as numbers, in the grand scheme of things, numbers are part of who we are. Like your phone number, for instance. That's why at Alive, we believe you should keep your number when you switch. Go in store today and ask an Alive switch angel. They'll make it real simple for you. We are Alive. internet speeds for free when you get TV, internet, and phone. Ask for Trio from Rev. Yes. 
For news that's happening in our country, the best place to turn is our news. Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight. The biggest on stories on the best station. Offering news tonight. The government collected almost. The education minister. The Bahama claims committee explains how unsecured. Giving you all sides of the equation to keep you informed. Well, in other news, police are cracking and down on the claims of Bahamas predators and former police are on the scene here at a popular hangout. Statement hangar yesterday, Catholic Archbishop. Watch our news weeknights 7:30 and weekends at 7 p.m. only on RTV. Welcome back to On the Record. Tonight we are continuing our discussion with guest Gawain Bo, looking at the possible effects of another downgrade. Um, DPM Turnquest, who is also the Minister of Finance, has said that uh, the IDB Public Financial Management Project um, is being implemented to bring more accountability and transparency. Um, part of or one of government's measures to to become a little more fiscally responsible but interestingly enough this morning you know we met newspaper headlines with former minister ken dorset um being arrested and, and facing charges of bribery um relative to his time in office and you know you look at that you look at all of the the pronouncements of the now government to the contracts wastage hiring etc that would have come um, under the previous administration and really you begin to say to yourself you know um, how much of this has contributed to the situation that we now find ourselves in what we have is just a poor financial reporting system um, give an example that when you go into government agencies and you see a green screen when is the last time you've seen that outside of government that the age of the systems and the quality of financial information, the timeliness, the relevance of it um, is a major challenge. When we look at budget debates, every year, the previous year's budgets always get revised or the outturns from the previous year. There's never any discussion and analysis to say, you know, why did I not meet my revenue target? Why did I exceed my expenditure target? Did I actually achieve the objectives I set in the previous budget? We just move on to the next budget. When we look at the um, actual financial statements of the government, um, the Auditor General is probably in 2013 in terms of auditing. We're now in 2017. Wow. So really, you know, is the information going to be relevant when he's finished? Because it's, it's four years old. And let's say he's at 2014, so three years old in that regard. What the PFM or the, 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 the financial management, public financial management project is centered around, and BICA is playing an active role, the Chamber of Commerce is going to contribute in that as well. It is saying bring our financial reporting into the 21st century. So have a, a general ledger or a set of accounting records that is real time, that is in a system now that is capturing information. Uh, reflect our assets reflect our liabilities when we incur them, not when we pay them. So get ourselves firstly to have financial statements that when you pick up as a layman, you don't have to be a financial expert, you have an appreciation for where you stand as a country at any point in time. But what that will then allow is then you can actually manage the affairs of the country on data-driven information as opposed to gut feel. Right now when we talk about the challenges even in the current environment, the, the terms misfeasance and abuse of um, funds and wastage, etc. Even though there may be elements of truth to that, it's still based on gut feeling, right? It is then coming around and saying, well, how do I determine what was an appropriate amount versus what was expended? And this goes back to all administrations in terms of saying, how do I analyze and evaluate that? There are poor decisions and poor judgments versus actual malpractice, if you will, in that regard. Mm -hmm. And there's a very thin line when you're trying to distinguish the two. But if you don't have financial statements and financial information that is current and real time, how do you actually run the affairs of the country? 
you know, as a Bahamian people, this gut feeling, we've gotten so used to that, right? That we, we, we feel this is the way to go, or we feel this is the right thing. And when we did the analysis on VAT implementation, it cost us $150,000 just to do the um, economic analysis. So think about that as, as just a microcosm of the wider government financial affairs. We will have to spend money in order to improve what we're doing. We need to get to a situation where there's clear and transparent tendering so that this ambiguity yeah. of, okay, I put issue. in a bid, mm -hmm. and then I don't know where it goes, and all I know is who comes out winning, yeah. right? We need to have, and there's a project in tow for that one as well, where there's a uh, vendor registry. There's going to be an automated system that says all bids will go. You can log in. You can see the project. You can see the bids. You can see the amounts. And the people and you behind can see that. It, evaluate right? the ones that are there. Yeah. And so it, th what we really need in the country is a very basic uh, concept. It's a culture change. Our mindset is always, well, take away or correct the wrongdoing as long as it don't impact me. If I only take in, you know, a small amount on the side here, don't, why are you going to impact me on that? And you hear the cries, you know, that's how we live, right? Well, why is it how we live? If we are saying we make sure all of the monies get into the government coffers, we are making sure that they are expended prudently and with a very fiscally responsible party in, 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 in charge of it, then ultimately the country does well. That's the tide that floats all boats. If the country does well, as an entrepreneur, we should have enthusiasm and optimism about being able to take advantage of a stable government financial situation. Do you find, and I mean, I think you can speak to this even from your professional career, I mean, when you, you talk about auditing and, and giving an account mm -hmm. um, and public records, do you find that people then will be less inclined um, to do the things that they do? Or you think people will still find ways around um, still find ways to do these nefarious things that they do. Let, let's be very clear. Fraud is a, is a global phenomenon that is taking you know, hold and companies, private companies, are finding they have to be very innovative in terms of um, detecting, but more importantly preventing the fraud that takes place. What persons and companies and governments should be doing is saying, well look, if I get to a point where I am current in my financial statement preparation, my audits, I'm identifying the areas where I'm losing and I am correcting them real time. I'm correcting them in a very efficient manner so that it at least closes the loophole. If you and I decide to collude, hmm. it's impossible. Even an auditor you know, is going to come in and not be able to detect it because if I'm responsible for um, authorizing, you're responsible for recording. You know, and we say, you know, let's get together and make sure that I'll put this transaction through, you make sure it don't get recorded and we take the funds. That's difficult to detect, right? However, if we say, well, there's segregation of duties and we have checks and balances, we have, if you get caught, even but once, there's no question you're terminated, mm -hmm. you're prosecuted, and you are give, um, held as an example of what will happen. I was about to say, hopefully, Then yeah. you get to the point where a person stop and think. Now, those who are evil-minded, they will always find uh, ways to carry out nefarious activities. Minds, However, yeah. the average person who may do it simply because everyone else is doing it, and I would feel that you know they're getting something when I'm not getting, that person will think twice because it will say, well, you know, it ain't worth me going to jail yeah, for, yeah, for twenty dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So hopefully. You know, at the end of the day, that there is, uh, we begin to, to sort of change that culture. I um, want to go back really to how our discussion began. Uh, heaven forbid that this uh, credit rating downgrade takes place. What's the worst can happen? Let's look at sort of worst case scenarios. What can we expect? Well, what a credit rating does, and going back to the same household, it makes your cost of borrowing increase. If you go to the bank and you say to the bank, I want to borrow $100,000, and you're just a bad credit, one, they may not give you any more money. And that's the potential worst case scenario that persons internationally will say, you know what, this credit rating frightens me. I don't want to give money. However, that doesn't exist because even junk bonds for corporates and countries around the world find an investor willing to invest. It is the price at which you have to pay mm. to get their money. The pay back. So now, if I believe, so use the credit card as an example. Credit card companies expect to lose by people not paying. 
So they charge an interest rate of 18%. Mm -hmm. When I expect that you are a prime borrower, I may charge you at 6%. So now when we put it into the government coffer context, if our credit rating continues to slide, the cost of our borrowing will increase. Now what does that mean for the country? Right now, debt repayment and interest payments are about 30-35% of the budget every year. That pushes that number up. That says the amount of discretionary spending contracts. When you add on top of that the actual payroll cost, which is another 30 to 35 percent, almost 70 percent of our budget is taken up just by payroll and, and debt repayments. If debt repayment increases, that 30 percent wiggle room at the end then it becomes decreases. even smaller, and wow. that's before you even pay our bills. So there is a knock on effect that says we have to arrest it, but we have to arrest it for a very basic reason. The old people always taught me, and old people hated to owe money. Mm -hmm. And so as a country, we have to go back to that where we hate to owe money. anybody anything. And so we have to start paying back our bills and tightening our belts to do so. And stop using, taking a loan to go on vacation. vacation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many fear too that, um, I don't know whether really it's, it's founded, but many fear that we may face a devaluation of the dollar. Mm -hmm. That is one that is pandemonial that has always been sown by politicians during um, election times, and it lingers. If you look at the fundamentals of how our dollar is pegged, our fiscal affairs do impact it, but not in the, is not correlated one to one like people see it. So for every Bahamian dollar in circulation, the central bank will say to you, sitting in their reserves is almost a dollar in U.S. currency. Right? And sometimes there's more than one for one. And that's how we actually protect the currency. So we could give up, you know, seeing Salinden and Sestafidzans and Samilo Butler on the Bahamian bill and just become a dollarized, US dollarized economy. So as it relates to that element, we're not in imminent danger. Now, if we continue to have to borrow foreign currency, we have to pay back foreign currency. That will continue to have an impact on the reserves. As the reserves decline, the fundamentals of the one-for-one one peg come under threat. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have to arrest this, not because, okay, the, the, the credit rating itself is going to lead to devaluation. It is saying that if we don't get our fiscal affairs in order, we are going to face trouble. And we see it, Jamaica, Haiti, now Barbados. So it's not like we have to look far. Mm -hmm. That the We really need right to there. simply say that do we want to go down a path we've already seen? Final question as we prepare to wrap up. Really, what should government be doing over the next few months to begin to arrest this situation um, and to begin to turn this around? It has to have an effective plan in place. And personally, I would like to see the National Development Plan efforts accelerated so that we have a 25, 30-year plan that gives us something to work towards over a long term. So it takes away this five-year election cycle out of mm -hmm. the equation. But the immediate elements of the government of the day have to be, well, I am demonstrating that I am changing my expenditure patterns. I am looking for creative ways. If I'm going to take on a building and buy a building, why is it that I occupy 100% of it? Can I occupy 50% rent the others mm -hmm. to pay for it? When I look at roads that I've been put in, am I taxing the road users sufficient funds? When I look at the revenues that I'm collecting, am I going after persons so that I collect every dollar that I have? And the example the government sets will actually impact the way we do things. And so if you said, what is it that they need to do? They need to demonstrate that there is a plan for the future that has milestones and timelines and they will be judged against it. Like what we do in private business. It's just everything else. <laughs> Gowan, well, thank you very much. This certainly has been a very informative discussion tonight. I'm hoping that our audience was able to uh, learn quite a bit about really the state of our economy and where we are and the potential effects of this downgrade should this go through. And certainly um, begin to look at what we can all do um, to exercise a lot more fiscal prudence in the country. I think sometimes that in our own lives, um, we don't exercise the proper prudence, <laughs> but we look to government to do it. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, Always a pleasure. Continued success. Draw. We hope that you have enjoyed our show tonight. Special thanks to my guest, Gowen Bo, the producer, technical staff, and of course you, the audience, for watching night after, well, week after week. Be sure and join us for more On the Record next week. Once again, I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. See you next time.